We're right in the middle of Paul's letter to the Philippians, starting now at chapter three, where he writes in such a warm manner, generally speaking, to this church. I mean, we've noticed that the kind of uh, hallmarks of this letter, as we've taken a look at the first two chapters, are first of all, the great um, warmth of relationship that Paul has with the Philippians. You can tell that he loved them and they loved him. We also noticed in Philippians the tremendous repetition of the idea of joy. He, he's emphasizing this idea all the time about how the Philippians should be joyful and that Paul is joyful and that even in the distress of his present circumstances, because we remember he wrote this from prison. He wrote this from his Roman imprisonment, which at the time that Paul wrote this, he thought was very possibly going to end in his execution. Nevertheless, there's really the, the hallmark of joy about this until we get to chapter three. And with chapter three, you almost sort of have a distraction entering into the letter. Um, you, you, you have a disruption, so to speak. And you'll see what I mean. Let's take a look at the first two verses. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Now, do you see what I mean? When we take a look at verse 2, it seems totally out of character with the letter as we have known it thus far. But maybe we should start at verse 1. Paul begins there with finally. He's not using finally as the sense that a preacher might use it today. You know, that he's sort of beginning his introduction. Although, you know, the old joke goes that when the preacher says finally, it means he's about half through. You know, he's got another uh, half of the sermon to go. But that's not Paul's idea here at all. The, the, the words translated by the word finally are literally as for the rest. It's more a statement of transition to another topic than it is Paul saying, I'm summing up the letter. And so he says, finally, my brethren, or, you know, moving on to another topic, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, again, here we're on familiar ground, the theme of rejoicing and joy, even in the midst of distressing circumstances, uh, is predominant throughout the letter. Now, Paul shared with the Philippians this principle of being able to rejoice and rejoice in the Lord. Again, not in circumstances, not in situations, but in the Lord who works all things together for good. And this abiding joy is very appropriate for a believer. I, I've been impressed all over again, taking a look at this passage and thinking about it, that, you know, it's really a duty of us Christians to be joyful. I, I, I have sympathy. I have pity upon our more uh, morose or depressed brothers or sisters. You know, th th there needs to be some comfort extended to them. But let's face it, uh, a, a chronic lack of joy is just a flat out bad testimony. I mean, what does Jesus Christ fill your life with no gladness? The, the abiding joy that we're supposed to have, it's just appropriate for the believer because it shows that we really do trust a God whom we really do believe is in control. Now, when you believe that, there's no surprise that you're often filled with joy. And so he says, rejoice in the Lord. And, and I would just impress upon you that at least in some measure, it's a duty for us to cultivate this joy. I think sometimes we regard joy in the Lord as something that just happens to us. You know, you're walking along the street and either joy in the Lord falls on you from the sky or it doesn't. And I would say that there's at least a certain element of our choice involved with this. You're going to choose whether or not you're going to rejoice in the Lord or not. Matter of fact, wouldn't you say that that's inherent in the whole context here where Paul impresses on them almost if, as if it were a command? Rejoice in the Lord. Hey, no, I'm telling you, rejoice in the Lord. Oh, Paul, I don't really feel like it. My circumstances are pretty bad. Paul would hold up the chains on his hands and say, I'm in prison here and I'm rejoicing in the Lord. What's wrong with you? And so again, I think we have to get past the place where we think that this joy, this abiding joy we have in the Christian life is dependent upon circumstances or necessarily even dependent upon our personality. No, it's dependent upon our great confidence in the God who reigns from heaven. So finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. This makes me believe that perhaps Paul is going to touch now upon some themes 
not that he has written about before. What we are going to look at in the following verses are not repeated things from earlier in the letter, but on things that he talked about when he was among the Philippians, right? I mean, let's face it. He started the church there. He spent some number of weeks, some number of months with the church there in Philippi. Uh, He taught them about many things. And now Paul is going to repeat some themes that he had taught them before. And he says, it's no problem for me to do it. It's not tedious for me. For you, it's safe. I, I don't mind repeating them because it's for your safety. And Paul did not remind, did not mind, I should say, reminding them about these things because he was passionately concerned about these particular dangers that he's going to describe in verse two. And again, as we come into verse two, now we sense that the whole tone of the letter has changed. No longer is it, oh, joy, I love you. You love me, Philippians. Look at how strong he warns in verse two, where he says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. Now, I mean, we're just sort of startled by verse two. First, we wonder if Paul isn't giving some kind of instruction for raising pets in the home. You know, beware of dogs. What's he speaking about with that? No, no, no. You have to understand. You have to connect all three phrases there. First, it's beware of dogs, right? Secondly, it's beware of evil workers. Third, it's beware of the mutilation. What does he mean by beware of dogs? Well, I I, I think you have to go back to the idea of what a dog was in the ancient world, in the ancient Mediterranean world at that time, uh, especially from the Jewish culture from which Paul came. And and when he uses the term dogs there, it's a harsh reference to the troublemaking legalists who wanted to deceive the Philippians. You see, dogs is exactly the term of contempt that a Jew would use against a Gentile. They would say, Gentile dogs. Paul means a lot by using this word, this phrasing, speaking against Jewish legalists. And so he says, listen, beware of these troublemakers. And the idea of a dog is like that. It's, it's in the, in the Eastern world there, it was like a scavenger. It, it was quarreling among themselves, you know, sort of biting at each other and biting the passerby. And, and Paul says, these people, they're like dogs. They're, they'll snap at you. They're dangerous. They run in packs. Be careful of these people who carry these doctrines. You say, well, what doctrines? What are these dangerous dog-like doctrines that they carry about with them? Well, look at the next one, verse 2. Beware of evil workers. Now, I want you to notice, I think he's choosing his phrasing very carefully here because they're workers, in other words, with an emphasis on works, but it's not unto good, it's unto evil. Paul will admit that these people have a concern for works, but it's for evil works. Now, you got to connect it to the third one, right? First, beware of dogs, Beware of evil workers. And now we get down into the real core of it here in verse two at the end of it, where he says, beware of the mutilation. Now, if you weren't certain that Paul was speaking of legalists that came from a Jewish context, now there's no doubt about it. And and let me explain. When Paul is warning about these people, he's not warning about Jews who remained um, secure in their Judaism. He's talking about Jews who came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, yet they defined their Christianity as basically a, a um, an aspect of their Judaism. They would consider themselves to be Jews first and Christians second, right? Now, you can understand how this thinking arose in the early church, right? Let's remind ourselves, in the first 10 years or so of the early church, all the believers were Jews. Christianity was a sect, so to speak, of Judaism. It was one group within Judaism. It was only after Gentiles began coming into the church, that there started rising up this huge controversy. And this was the controversy. Many of these Jewish background Christian believers, because that we're, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about people who trusted in Jesus as the Messiah. We're talking about people who believed that Jesus died on the cross for them. 
But what they believed was that if you really wanted to become a Christian, what you first had to do was become a Jew. Now, do you understand their thinking here? First of all, for them, it didn't really matter because they were born Jews, right? So no big deal to them. But then when they saw a Gentile who wanted to become a Christian, they said, fine, you can become a Christian. But since Christianity comes out of Judaism, you need to become a Jew first, and then you can be a Christian. Now, what these people demanded of Gentiles was that they become circumcised. And circumcision in itself wasn't the big hang up. It wasn't so much, you know, cutting away of the male foreskin that was the big deal. Circumcision was the official connection that a person made to come under the law of Moses. And so obviously, for example, women could not be circumcised. And it was irrelevant for them in that sense. But a woman had to come under the law of Moses, even though she could not be circumcised, just as much as a Gentile man would have to come under the law of Moses. Paul is speaking about these people. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and then beware of the mutilation. And when he uses that term, mutilation, he's using a play on words in the ancient Greek. He's using a word that's similar to the ancient Greek word for circumcision, but really just means hacking off or mutilation. And basically what he's saying is these people are not preaching circumcision. They're preaching mutilation. Now, I imagine that if any of these Jewish background believers would have read this, they would have been horrified at what Paul said. They would have thought, how dare you refer to me this way? I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. I just simply believe that, that Gentiles can only come to Jesus if they come through Moses first. And Paul said, that is exactly where you're wrong. You know, really to understand the true error of this thinking, you, you could go back to two places that I think are great to go back to. You could go back to Acts chapter 15, where they had the famous council in Jerusalem, where they decided this issue. You know, when Gentiles first started coming into the church, this was a very legitimate issue, and it had to be discussed. And they discussed it at the Council of Jerusalem, and, and the apostles and the prophets together got together, and they decided that absolutely a man does not have to become a Jew before he becomes a Christian. But then also another place where you can examine this is from the book of Ephesians, where Paul explain, explains God's great plan in creating the church. And he explains it in these terms. He said, God's plan in the church was to make one new man out of the two. In other words, what is the church? And Paul would say, it's not Jew. It's not Gentile. It's something new entirely. It is the church. And so you don't have to come through Judaism to come to the church. You can go there directly by your faith in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Paul looks at these legalists, these, these Christians. I, this is what I want to make point clear to you. These were Christians that he had the issue with. But they were Christians from a Jewish background. And Paul wants to make it very clear that, that he did not see their insistence on circumcision as something beautiful or noble. He regarded it as an ugly example of mutilation. So he's speaking about it in very, very strong terms. Now he continues on the thought right into verses 3 and 4 where he says, now notice this, notice how bold he is, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks that he might have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Now, these Christians of a Jewish background who were of a legalistic nature, they considered themselves to be the ones truly circumcised and right with God. They would basically say, yes, I'm right with God. And they wouldn't say, you know, because I'm circumcised. 
Listen, they understood that a person could be circumcised and not under the law of Moses. You need to, to understand that when Paul talks about circumcision here, he's using it almost as a sense as a symbol of coming under the law of Moses. And so they would say, yes, we're under the law of Moses. We're the ones who are righteous. And Paul says, no, you're not at all. And then Paul says, for we are the circumcision. And Paul declared that he and his followers, Gentiles among them, were the true circumcision. Now you got to say, that's pretty radical, isn't it? Because in a surgical sense, if I could state the case so plainly, in a surgical sense, many of those whom Paul referred to were not circumcised. But he says they are the true circumcision. Why? B- because a, 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 a part of their physical flesh has been cut away? No, he says. What defines the true circumcision before God? He says right here in verse 3, those who worship God in spirit. That defines the true circumcision. As opposed to the fleshly and external worship emphasized by these legalists. By the way, you can make a pause if you'd like to write in your Bible. Maybe you draw a little circle around that word worship. It's an interesting and unique word for worship that Paul uses there in the ancient Greek language. It's the translation of the ancient Greek word referring to the service of Jehovah by his peculiar people, by the priests. Let me put it this way. According to to, uh, Wiest, he says a Jew would be scandalized by the application of this word to a Gentile. He would say the, the, the Gentiles can't serve God in this way. And Paul says, oh, yes, they can. Oh, yes, they can. Now, let me just pause right here and talk about this bigger picture of keeping the law, right? Some people wonder today, you know, a a baby boy is born and, and, you know, the the mother and father, well, you know, should I have him circumcised? The Old Testament says that you should, you know, or people wonder, should I keep the Sabbath, right? You know, the Old Testament says I should. Uh, Should I keep kosher? You know, the Old Testament says I should. And and, and there's only one proper answer to those things. Go ahead and circumcise the child if you want to. Go ahead and observe the Sabbath if you want to. Go ahead and eat kosher if you want to. You are free to do it or to not do it, but do not believe for a moment that it makes you more right with God. That's the trap, isn't it? It, It's not circumcision or uncircumcision. It's not Sabbath keeping or not Sabbath keeping. It's not kosher or non-kosher. It's believing that doing it or not doing it is a ground of righteousness before Jesus Christ. Where again, what is the only ground of righteousness? It's that connection by faith. So he says, we are the true circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Next, who rejoice in Christ Jesus. Now, isn't this wonderful? Their rejoicing is in Christ Jesus. It's not in their own performance. Couldn't you see the legalistic mindset at works here saying, who rejoice in all the good things they do to become approved by God? Yeah, that's what I rejoice in. I I rejoice that I'm so good that God loves me. I rejoice that I keep the Sabbath. I rejoice that I observe the law of Moses, including my circumcision. I rejoice that I eat kosher, just like it does. I observe all the purification laws, on and on and on. Paul says, no, no, that's no ground of rejoicing. The only ground of rejoicing for God's true circumcision is Christ Jesus. And then the third aspect, you saw it right there in verse 3, and have no confidence in the flesh. You can just imagine with what strength Paul meant this, because what is legalism if it is not confidence in the flesh? Now, maybe I should just pause for a moment here and make a very important distinction, because I've used the word legalism many, many times already this evening, haven't I? And I probably will use it many times yet to come. But we should make a vital understanding of what legalism is and is not. Nobody should think for a moment that obedience is legalism. And sometimes when there is a stirring call to obedience among Christians, people say, oh, legalism, legalism. That's legalism, isn't it? No, no, a thousand times no. To call believers to obedience is not legalism. What legalism is, it's to say that my relationship with God is based upon my performance. 
That is the core of my standing before God. How does God feel about me? He feels about me based on how good or bad I've been. That's legalism. Whereas instead, the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ says that God's opinion of me, my standing with God, is based on my relationship by faith with Jesus Christ. That's the whole difference. But nobody should confuse this for a moment. Don't think that whenever there's a call to obedience that somehow the church has gotten legalistic. Not at all. There's a true difference between the two. So again, the third characteristic, uh, sort of getting back on track here. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. That's number one. Rejoice in Christ Jesus, number two. And then now number three, and have no confidence in the flesh. And now Paul, oh, he enters in on one of the most beautiful sections in this whole letter, starting here with verse four. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he might have confidence in the flesh, I more so. You see, Paul knew that he was more qualified to be justified by the keeping of the law than any of those legalistic opponents that he had. He'd look at these, uh, again, they were Christians, but from a Jewish background who tended towards legalism. And Paul says, you guys think you're right with God based on what you do? He goes, man, I was way ahead of you. And now he's going to go on and explain in the way that, well, in the way that Paul can here in verses 5 and 6. Take a look at this. Paul says, circumcised the eighth day. Of course, he's speaking of himself. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now look at this statement of his own qualifications. You understand what Paul's getting at here, right? He's saying, okay, if we're going to be justified by the law, I'll tell you how easy it would be for me to consider myself justified by the law. First of all, I was circumcised the eighth day. Now this begins a section where Paul listed four things that were his possession by birth. All reasons why he might have confidence in the flesh. He was circumcised the eighth day in accordance with Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3. By the way, did Paul have anything to do with that? No. He didn't say on the sixth day, hey, mom and dad, in two more days, you better have me circumcised. No, 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 he didn't do that. He didn't have anything to do with that. that. That was his heritage by birth. And then it says that he was of the stock of Israel. Paul was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and therefore he was an heir to God's covenant with them. Now, did Paul have anything to do with that? No, that was just his birthright uh, by virtue of the family that he was born into. Then he says that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. And this was a distinguished tribe. You know, uh, Benjamin was distinguished by the fact that it gave Israel her first king, King Saul. It was the tribe that allied itself with faithful Judah when Israel divided into two nations at the time of Rehoboam. And it was also the tribe that had the city of Jerusalem within its boundaries. When you go to Jerusalem today, you're going to the ancient territory of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. And so it was a somewhat of an esteemed tribe. Again, this wasn't an achievement that Paul made in his own life. It was an accident of his birth, but it was a qualification nonetheless. And then finally he says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now, do you know what that means? It means that Paul grew up in and embraced Hebrew culture instead of Hellenistic culture or Greek culture. You see, in Paul's day, there was a great divide in the Jewish community in the first century. There were basically two different groups of Jews. There were Hebraic Jews and there were Hellenistic Jews. The Hebraic Jews were the ones that thought, listen, we should speak a uh, Hebrew, we should learn Aramaic, we should keep the customs of ancient Israel. They were the ones that were very much wanting to be like the ancient Jewish community. And then there were the Hellenistic Jews. Uh, Hellenism refers to the culture of Greece. And the Hellenistic Jews were the ones who said, listen, man, that old Jewish stuff, that's for grandma and grandpa. It's a new world out there, right? You know, so let's get along with Greek culture. We need to appreciate the good things of Greek culture, of modern day Greek culture. I'm still a Jew, but I'm a Jew who lives in Greek culture. Well, you can imagine how the two different groups thought about each other, right? 
the Hellenistic Jews looked at the Hebrew Jews and said, you old fuddy-duddies, you're like the Amish as far as we're concerned, right? You're nothing but an old, you know, anachronism. You're just, you're just from centuries ago. Why don't you come into, they'd say, why don't you come into the first century if they dated their time like that? You know, that, that, that would be their message. Then again, you can imagine what the Hebrews thought of the Hellenistic Jews. They said, you total sellouts. You're just living for the modern culture and you don't care anything about the things of God or the great traditions of our people. So which side was more holy? Well, certainly it would have been the Hebrews. And Paul says, not only was I a Hebrew, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. So he listed four things that were his by birth. Then he goes on and he lists four things that were his by achievement. He says, concerning the law of Pharisee, Well, that was Paul's standing regarding the law. This tells us that among an elite people, that was the Jewish people, Paul was of an elite sect, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were known for their scrupulous devotion to the law of God. I want you to understand that there were never really ever that many Pharisees. One estimate says that there were never more than 6,000 Pharisees. But they were considered to be what you might call the spiritual athletes of their day. When people walked down the street and saw Pharisees, they said, listen, I may think that guy's a jerk, but man, that man is totally sold out to God. You see, the name Pharisee means separated ones. And the Pharisees had separated themselves from all of common life and from all of common tasks in order to make it one aim in their life fulfilled, and that was to keep the law in the smallest detail. Now imagine that. Imagine if that was the absolute passion of your life, to keep the law of God to the smallest detail. And of course, that's reflected for us in many passages in the New Testament. For example, where Jesus spoke about the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. And he says, you know, you you tithe from your mint gardens, you know, from your herb gardens. There you are counting out seeds, you know, from your herb garden. And you count out, you know, nine for me and one for the Lord. They were absolutely scrupulous in the way that they kept the law. And, And then Paul goes on here. Concerning the law of Pharisee, that's the end of verse 5. Now the beginning of verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. How zealous was I, Paul says? I'll tell you how zealous I was. I persecuted the church. Do you understand what that means? It means that Paul was not merely an intellectual opponent of what he thought were heresies against Judaism. He was also an active fighter against them. Even when he was blind to God. You know, later in the book of Romans, Paul wrote that the Jews of his day have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Paul knew that because that was him before he met God on the Damascus road. And then he says this amazing summary statement there at the end of verse six, concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. In other words, when they measured righteousness, according to the law, Paul was blameless. Do you remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? You remember that whole exchange? The rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and what does he say? He says, uh, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, after some introductory comments, Jesus says, well, it's pretty simple. You have to keep the law. And what was the response of the rich young ruler? I've kept the law from my youth. Yeah, that whole business of keeping law. Oh, Jesus, I do that. Now, you and I read that, and we think, You know, how could the guy say that with a straight face? How could the guy really say, I keep the law of God and don't break it? But that was exactly the way that first century Jews thought, that it was entirely possible for a person to be blameless in their conduct of life and be righteous according to keep the law. And Paul says, you know what? If there was a line for those guys, I was first in line. So listen, here's the whole summary of verses four, five, and six. If anyone could lay claim to pleasing God by law keeping and by the works of the flesh, it was Paul. Paul was far more qualified to do this than his legalizing opponents to to make such a claim. So 
after all of that qualifications that he states. You can look it over again here in verses 5 and 6. Matter of fact, why don't we do that? We'll just read from 5, 6, and then on into 7. He says, uh, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me these I have counted loss for Christ. You see, any of these corrupting teachers, you know, the mutilation, the dogs, the evil workers, any one of these corrupting teachers would have been proud to claim Paul's pedigree. You know, when he wrote what he wrote in verses 5 and 6, those corrupting teachers were listening to that going, wow, I wish I had that. Paul said, you know what? You can take all of that achievement, all of those qualifications that were mine by both birth and achievement. You can take all of it, and I counted it all loss for Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, it's very interesting, the wording he uses here in the original Greek. He says, but what things were gained to me? Gain is in the plural. What things were gains? These were all gains to me. It was all a big group of gains, but loss is in the singular. It's as if he says, all those various gains are counted together as one loss. I like what Spurgeon says about this. He says that Paul was skilled in spiritual arithmetic. And he, and he was a very careful counter. He cast up his accounts with caution and observed with a diligent eye his losses and his gains. He said, okay, I'll put it all on the ledger. Right. Here's all my gains. Here's everything I achieved, both by my birth and my own personal achievement. There it is all on one side of the ledger. And he goes, you know what? I'm looking at all that and, and I count it. I count it loss. Why does he count it loss? Because on the one side of the ledger is all of his achievements, all the things that would count him righteous or blameless in the eyes of man. That's on one side of the ledger. What's on the other side of the ledger? Jesus Christ. So all his personal achievements, that's one side. The other side, Jesus, he gets out a big red pen and he crosses out all of his achievements. He goes, this is all in the lost column. All this stuff kept me from Jesus. It is lost. Paul says, I have counted these things lost. I want you to notice, he made a decision to count them lost. It wasn't so much that they were a loss by their very character as much as Paul chose to regard them as a loss. Not so much because it was harmful. Before. Was it harmful for Paul to be circumcised? Was it harmful for Paul to be a devout Jew? It wasn't harmful. But what those things were and why they were a loss was because they were ways that Paul sought to please God in the energies of the flesh. You see, before Paul became a Christian, he thought that all of these things made him a success in trying to please God by his works. And so he says, no, I count them all up and they're a loss. You know what this whole passage makes me think about? It makes me think of that great parable that Jesus told. It's a very brief parable, but it's the parable of the pearl of great price. You remember that? Where this man, he, he sees a pearl and he wants the pearl. The guy's like a pearl freak. You know, they, he, he looks at this pearl and he goes, oh, my heavens, I just want this pearl. You got to admit, unbalanced man, right? <laughs> oh, I got to have that pearl. And what does he do? He sells everything he has to get that. Everything. Can you imagine what a lunatic that is? Right? Everything that he has, he sells it so he can get this one pearl. And, and at the end of it all, what does he say? Boy, am I stupid for selling everything for this pearl. Is that what he says? No, he's delighted with it. Because he realizes that that pearl was better than anything he had. That reminds me of Paul here. He looks at everything he had and goes, I counted it all as loss. When the light of Jesus Christ shone on me on the road to Damascus, I did an instant, you know, economic calculation. I became an accountant right then. And I counted it all up. I counted up every effort I had to make myself right and make myself approved before God. And I moved it all over in the loss column. I counted as loss so that I could gain Jesus Christ. Okay, you have that in perspective now, right? Now look at verse 8. Yet indeed, well, stop right there. Those two words, yet indeed, they actually translate five ancient Greek words. 
And it's sort of word piled on top of word. This is how Wiest translates this. He says, yea, indeed, therefore, at least, even. The, the idea is, is Paul is showing with all the force, with all the conviction he has. It, it's not just yet indeed. It's like, yes, amen, hallelujah. With all my strength and all my passion, I declare to you. Okay, so you get, I want you to get the feeling of this. This is a strong statement he's throwing out here. And he says right here in verse eight, yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Hey, now, honestly, you look at verse eight and then you look at verse seven and you say, Paul, aren't you just repeating yourself? You know, you're getting kind of repetitious, aren't you? No, no, no. Paul is not repeating himself. Do you know what the big difference is between verse seven and verse eight? In verse 7, it says plainly, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. It's in the past tense. Paul is speaking about what he did at his conversion, right? When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I took all of that self-righteousness in myself and I counted it as loss and I gave my life to Jesus. Now, do you see what he's doing in verse 8? Verse 8, when he says, I also count all things lost, it's in the present tense. Move ahead some 30 years after Paul gave his life to Jesus Christ. And there he is, chained to a Roman soldier, under Roman imprisonment, lost everything. Anything he owned, anything he had, it's gone now. And you know what might be waiting for him after he appears before Caesar? It might be off with his head time. He considers all of that. He looks around his surroundings. Here I am, I don't have anything. I don't have many friends. I'm chained to a soldier. I might be executed any day now. And you know what? I still count all those things lost for the excellency of knowing Jesus Christ. See, isn't that wonderful? Paul made a calculation at his conversion. And then 30 years later, he recalculated. He was a careful man, right? So let me go over these figures again. Let me think of all that I had, all I could have been, all I could have achieved. Let me think about it all. Okay, I'll calculate it. And then I'll measure it against what he says right there in verse 8. The excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And he goes, no, that wins out. Let everything else be moved into the lost column. Spurgeon says it like this. After 30 years or more of experience, Paul had an opportunity of revising his balance sheet and looking again at his estimates and seeing whether or not his counting was correct. What was the issue of his latest search? How do matters stand at his last stock taking? He exclaims with very special emphasis, yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I love these two different accountings that Paul made in his life. And I don't know, sometimes I think, sometimes I think that maybe we should do a new accounting in our life, right? At some time, years past, you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Uh, very well. God bless you for that. I'm glad that you did it. You know what? Maybe it's worth it for you to sharpen your pencil all over again and to do this spiritual accounting in your life and say, is it still worth it? Is it still worth it? I mean, honestly, maybe you would consider it's not worth it. Maybe you would rework the figures. Well, if that's the case, then that's the case with you. But I know very, very few followers of Jesus Christ who would ever say such a thing. They would agree with Paul. And Paul had even more reason to say it. Did you notice there in verse 8? For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. You see, for Paul, this counting was not merely an internal spiritual exercise. Paul had, in fact, suffered the loss of all things that he might gain Christ. Remember, folks, where he wrote this from. And not only does Paul say that, but in verse 8, he also says, and I count them rubbish. Now, this is even better. Because when Paul says rubbish, he uses very strong language. Literally, Paul considered them as excrement, as dung, not only as worthless, but offensive. Paul recalculated at the end of some 30 years, and he figured he got an even better bargain. Let me put it this way. At the beginning, he made his conversion. He goes, okay, um... Jesus versus all my self-righteous stuff? No, the self-righteous stuff, that's a loss. Okay? 
Now, 30 years later, he goes, okay, now, Jesus versus all my self-righteous stuff, my self-righteous stuff's manure, right? It's even stronger at the end of these 30 or so years. And so now Paul goes on to this great high ground that he's in at verse 9. He says, well, let's continue just from verse 8, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see, because Paul was in Christ, he could renounce his own righteousness and live by the righteousness which is from God by faith. The whole foundation for his spiritual life is what Jesus Christ did for him. Now, aren't we again at this great divide between legalism and a grace relationship with Jesus Christ? If the foundation of your Christian life, if the core of it is about what you must do for him, you're a legalist. But if the foundation of your Christian life is about what Jesus Christ has done for you, then you've just passed from law into grace. And that's why Paul can say the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see, these well-intentioned Christian legalists from a Jewish background, they wanted people to be righteous. Well, why do you think they preach the law? Why do you think they preach circumcision and the Sabbath and kosher food? Why Do you, do you think they did it because they hated people? No, they did it because they thought, well, well, listen, we want them to be righteous. I don't want you to go to hell for eating pork. I don't want you to go to hell because you never got circumcised. Listen, I know it's going to be painful for you, but listen, the, the, the fires of hell are a lot worse. And, and you got to have this righteousness. And it's just Paul is standing on a mountain shouting out, the righteousness that we have comes by faith in Jesus Christ, not by cutting, not by cutting out pork, not by, you know, not doing anything on the Sabbath. And he's laying out the great contrast there. I think it's amazing here that in comparison to the righteousness, which is God or in there in verse nine, where he says, not having my own righteousness. Paul disowned his own righteousness as eagerly as other men disowned their sins. So, you know what? Those things that other people thought were great about me, get them away from me. No, I don't want anything having to do with my own righteousness. I want the righteousness that's found in Jesus Christ. Then tonight we're going to conclude with verses 10 and 11. But don't think that that means that we're going to end necessarily soon. Because when we come to these two verses, you're going to see how this meditation upon renouncing his own righteousness and entering into this wonderful connection with God on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it just makes Paul soar. Have you ever seen like a like an eagle or a hawk, you know, flying in the sky? And there it is. And then all of a sudden, it'll catch like this thermal draft and then go up. You know, it's amazing to see. It's flying around at a certain level and then all of a sudden, without flapping its wings at all, it just rises up because it's caught some kind of thermal. Well, listen, Paul just caught a thermal draft right here. He's rising up in verses 10 and 11 and he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Do you see the simple plea of Paul's heart? That I may know him. You know, that is a plea that's unknown to the legalist. You know what the legalist has to know? The legalist has to know himself. Because he constantly has to measure whether or not he's right enough with God, right? Am I obedient enough? Am I doing enough? Is God happy with me enough? Because everything's based on their own performance. The legalist says that I may know my own condition. Paul says, I gave up on that a long time ago. My passion is to know Jesus Christ. You see, Paul is focused now upon Jesus, not upon himself. And to know Jesus is not the same as knowing his, histor his historical life. It's not the same as knowing correct doctrines regarding Jesus. It's not the same as knowing his moral example. And it's not the same as knowing his great work on our behalf. You, you could know uh, somebody who knows all of those facts, right? Somebody who's memorized the Gospels, who understands all the doctrinal intricacies, but yet they don't know him. Well, what is it to know somebody? Well, you know, 
You can say that you know someone because you recognize them. Because you can distinguish what is different about them compared to other people. Do you know Jesus in that way? Do you know what's different about Jesus? Or is he just another historical person to you? But when you know somebody, you know what's different about them. You know, it's very interesting when you sort of deal with people from different nationalities. You know, if you go to a country, you know, uh, where it's nationalities that you're not used to, to seeing all around, you go and you see, and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a thousand Chinese people in front of you. What's going to be your reaction? They all look alike. That's what you're going to say. And to your eye, they do. Why do they all look alike? Because you don't know them. If you knew them, you'd be able to see the distinctions right away. Because I'm sure that when the Chinese come and take a look at a, a, a group of Western Europeans, they look and they all look alike. They probably, probably what they're saying. But you see, when you know somebody, you recognize what's special about them, what's distinct about them. And so you ask yourself, do I know Jesus this way? We can say that we know someone because we're acquainted with what they do. Right. Uh, I know the baker because I get my bread from them. And that's a good way to know somebody. Right. Okay. well, first I recognize the baker. I can pick the baker out in a crowd. Right. Okay. fine. So I know the baker in that sense. Now I know the baker because I walk into their bakery and I get their bread. Hey, isn't that wonderful? I I know the baker because of what they do. Well, that's a way to know God, too. Do Do you know him because of what he does? And then you can say that you know someone because you actually have a conversation with them. So first you can pick the baker out in the crowd, then you visit their bakery, and then what do you do? You actually speak with them. You may speak about the weather, you you may speak about, you know, the sports match last night, whatever. You may talk about whatever you want to speak about, but you have another level of conversation with them, another way of knowing them, and this is another way that we know God. Then we can say, That we know someone because we spend time in their house and with their family. That's knowing them on all a different level, isn't it? The baker says, come on over to my house. Meet my family. You walk into their home. You're around their family. You know much more about them than you ever knew before, right? And then there's another level of knowing. You can say that, that you know somebody because you've committed your life to them and you want to live with them every day, sharing every circumstance with them as in a marriage. And that's really knowing somebody on an entirely different level, right? You know, here it is. You, you go to the baker's house, right? And, and there you are. You're enjoying go, Oh man, I'm really getting to know the baker. And, and you start chatting it up with the baker's wife and you say, wow, you know, th- this man, the man who owns this bakery here, this bakery, he's such a happy man. I just love his personality. It's so glowing and shining. And the baker's wife says, well, you don't know him like I know him. You know, he, he has his happy moods, but sometimes he gets very depressed. And, and you say, well, I never knew that about him, but who knows? Well, the wife knows, doesn't she? Because she's in a whole other level of knowing. You see, there is a way of knowing Jesus Christ that includes all of these, but yet goes beyond even them. When Paul says that I may know him, he wants to know him in everything, on every level, in every aspect. But not just him. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He wants to know in an experiential way the power of Jesus' resurrection. It's as if he wants that same power of Jesus' resurrection, not, not to know it just in a historical sense. By the way, which must have been amazing, right? I mean, you think of just this flash of radiant power when Jesus rose from the dead. You know, I find when you take a look at the records, especially in the Gospel of John, which speaks of the nature of the grave clothes of Jesus laid out in the tomb, the the, the implication is that Jesus virtually evaporated from those grave clothes because they were laying as if a body had been in them, you know, but just had been removed. And you think, what a, what a brilliant flash of power it must have been just to take that dead, dead body and, and in this brilliant flash of radiance, this powerful, radiant, you know, brightness to raise it up to new life and resurrection life. But that's not what Paul's talking about. 
You're not saying I want to get back in the time machine or see the, the video record from the resurrection of Jesus. He says, no, I want to know the power of resurrection as it is in my life right now. I want to know the power of Jesus Christ and his resurrection at work in my life. He says, I, I want to know because it, it, it's power to justify. It's power to give life. It's power to comfort. And Paul says, I want to know that power of the resurrection. And then he goes on into the next level, and you see that. First, that I may know him. Second, in the power of his resurrection. And the third one, you don't even want to look at, do you? Don't, don't scratch that from your Bible. It's okay to underline in your Bible, but don't scratch words out that you don't like to see. He says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. See, knowing Jesus also means knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. It's all part of our following Jesus and being in Christ. (laughs) Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Isn't that in some ways the most precious phrase to believers? In Christ, you are in him. He is in you. You are linked together with Jesus in this beautiful communion, this koinonia, this partnership. You are in Christ. And then you realized that the Son of Man was persecuted and mocked. The Son of Man was rejected of men. The Son of Man was cruelly beaten. The the, the Son of Man was crucified on a cross, and people rejoiced when they did it. Then you realize... I'm in Christ? Yeah. The fellowship of his sufferings as well. Going on to the next level there, verse 11. Being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. You see, being in Christ also means being in his death. I have to say, Don't you think that these words from the pen of Paul had a special poignancy in relation to what might have been his fate any day or any week as he sat there in the Roman imprisonment? If by any means I may be conformed to his death, you or I could write those words, and it's a nice spiritual thought, right? Paul writes those words knowing that his neck might be on the chopping block any day now. And then he says, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. I love that. Paul could have ended the sentence being conformed to his death. I mean, it, it kind of rolls off the tongue nicely. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, period. But Paul didn't end it there. You know why? Because Paul had the proper Christian outlook. He understood that the Christian life, though it is being crucified with Christ, that those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions of desires, that, that we do understand this fellowship of his sufferings, that never, never in the Christian life are we to be morbidly focused upon suffering and crucifixion with Christ. It's always a means to an end. The, the being conformed to his death it isn't a stopping place. It's a place you move through to resurrection power. And that's why he said, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul saw that the the death and the crucifixion and the sufferings, those were a necessary way to the goal of resurrection life right now and the ultimate resurrection of the dead. Might I say, that was a goal worth any means to Paul. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection dead. What, what, you mean, Paul, having all everything you have taken away from you? Yes. You, you, you mean by any means, by, by you being put in a Roman prison? Yes. By any means, do you mean being beaten by a savage mob? Yes. By any means, do you mean getting your head chopped off by the Romans' authorities? Yes, Paul would say. By any means that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And when he says that I may attain, don't think for a moment that Paul doubted whether or not he was saved. That wasn't it. But he did long mightily for the completion of his salvation through the resurrection of his body. Let's remind ourselves that the Bible presents our salvation to us in three time tenses, right? You were saved. You are saved. You're being saved. And finally, you will be saved. 
Resurrection is the final component of our salvation. And that's why Paul says, I long for my salvation to have the final component completed if I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Well, I don't know if I have anything more to say about these first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 3 other than just this. I want you to remember where Paul wrote this from. Paul wrote this from the context of having experienced more suffering. I'm going to go out on a limb and say this, that Paul wrote this from the context of having suffered more than anybody in this room has ever suffered. You see, this wasn't merely theological ideas for Paul. He's not spinning out noble thoughts for a devotional. This was a lived out connection with God. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Father, that's our prayer tonight. We can't read these words of the Apostle Paul without having the very strong impression that he knows something about a walk with you that we don't quite yet know. And Lord, it's not that Paul was more saved. It's not that Paul was more righteous. We believe, Lord, that all of these things are our common property in Jesus Christ. But Lord, we just want to pursue you and follow you and love you with a deepening connection, even as Paul experienced it. Make it the passion of our life, the passion of our heart, to be able to say, just like Paul did, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Thank you, Lord, for the surpassing greatness, the surpassing gain of knowing you and how all the rest of it counts as loss in comparison. Love you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen.